In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Guy Snodgrass, a retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot who was also a senior leader at Top Gun. After leaving Top Gun, went to the Pentagon where he was director of communications, and he was also the speechwriter for General Mattis. Uh, if that wasn't enough, he's also written two books, one about his experience with uh, Mattis and another that is coming out soon, but I will not go into it. I'll leave it over to Guy. Uh, Guy, thanks for coming on, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and how you got to becoming a pilot. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be back with you, and uh, thanks again for everything you've done through one of the other ventures you started, Elite Meet. Uh, you've made a big difference not only in my life, but the lives of uh, many other service members who you've helped along the way, so I really appreciate it. Uh, sure. When it comes to, you know, how I found myself on the path to becoming an elite fighter pilot, a Top Gun instructor, working at the highest levels of the White House and the Pentagon, I mean, I think it always comes down to the people around you, much like yourself, who are willing to, to step out of their own comfort zone, extend a, a hand, uh, reaching out to others to say, look, I've done well, let me help you. And I know I was a benefactor of that growing up in North Texas, had plenty of people in my community, at my school, at my church who knew I was passionate about aviation, wanted to support that dream and push me along the way. And of course, uh, once they've done that, then it's up to you with the hard work and dedication to see it through and make the most of those opportunities. So how, how long were you in an airplane? Like how, how, how many years were you flying? Yeah, all told, you know, so I was, a, I was a fighter pilot in the US Navy. I flew all told for about two decades, 20 years. I graduated the US Naval Academy in 1998 and uh, had a blast. You know, started off as a junior officer flying the F-A-18 Hornet, uh, served overseas uh, flying missions off an aircraft carrier that was stationed in the Gulf doing Operation Iraqi Freedom, so conducting missions over Iraq. And then uh, after that is when I kind of started down the pathway of becoming a Top Gun instructor, uh, heading overseas, flying missions out of Japan and the Indo-Pacific. So, I mean, when they say join the Navy, see the world, that's a very apt description. Well, before we go into the, the book that's coming out, which is really focused on, you know, it's what's called Top Guns Top 10. And I mean, really want to dive into some leadership principles and, and the meat of that book. But can you talk a little bit about first your experience with General Mattis and uh, the first book that you wrote? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was one of those just random moments in time. I had just returned. I'd been the commanding officer of a squadron that was stationed in Japan called the Dam Busters. And I had done well there, came back to the United States, had only been in Norfolk, Virginia. I was serving in a role that we call the executive assistant to an admiral. And uh, three months into that job, after having just moved from Japan, I get a phone call saying, General Mattis needs you in the Pentagon. Can you come assist him as his Pentagon's uh, director of communications and his chief speechwriter. And of course, when Secretary Mattis asks for something like that, when your country asks for something like that, the only right answer is to say, absolutely, I'm, I'm on my way. So packed up my bags, headed up to Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon. And it was a, an amazing journey for a year and a half. It was the first time in my career where I'd really been exposed to politics. Uh, that is the nature of a job like being a cabinet secretary. So not only working with the White House and other agencies within the federal government, working with members of Congress, of course, for testimony, but also traveling the world with Secretary Mattis. We spent a lot of times over in Brussels, Belgium, uh, for NATO ministerials with all the other nations that are part of NATO. We spent a lot of time in the Indo-Pacific, specifically South Korea and Japan and Australia. Uh, spent a lot of time in the Middle East, of course, which was a hotbed of activity as we were seeking to defeat and annihilate the terrorist group ISIS. So it was just one of those rare moments in time where you get this incredible expanding experience where you take your knowledge as an air pilot, which is about one core thing, and now you're exposed to the entirety of the U.S. government, the entirety of our national security apparatus. And that's what I wanted to capture for the first book. What was that experience like? Not from the perspective of a cabinet secretary, but for someone who's closely aligned with them and who is conducting a lot of the work behind the scenes so that others walking in my footsteps uh, could basically use it like breadcrumbs, uh, read about that experience and grow from it. It's amazing that you went from being a fighter pilot to director of communications for the Pentagon and then also <laughs> speechwriter for Mattis. Uh, what was a day in the life like when you were in that position? Like, what sure. does your I mean, week look like? What does your day look like? Yeah, it's a very long day. And it's funny, right? Because you don't just, like you said, you don't walk out of a cockpit one day and then step into the Pentagon as a director of communications the next. 
so much of our lives and our careers are based on not only your hard work and dedication, but by fate and timing. I had, when I had my first tour of duty in Japan, I had been asked to go to the, to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, did very well there. And that's, you know, that's where you're really immersed in naval history or in military history. You're writing a lot and, and my writing stood out. And so I had an opportunity to be a speechwriter in the 2013 timeframe to the head of the US Navy. And so that's what really got me established as a writer, someone who knew speech writing. And so if you carry that forward to whenever I had finished my squadron command, Mattis just had a need for someone who had that background and experience. And I was one of the few that had it. And that's how I got the job. So it wasn't like I just landed an aircraft, grabbed my <laughs> helmet bag and headed into the Pentagon to write speeches. Um, as far as for a day in the life, man, it, it, was, uh, it was like a fire hose. It was nonstop. You would show up anywhere from 5.30 to maybe 6.30 in the morning. You're reading all the uh, intelligence that's come in. You're reading all the news sources you can get your hands on to, to get a good sense for what the, the big areas of interest will be for Congress, for members of Congress, for the press. Uh, what are your allies and partners around the world thinking? What is President Trump thinking? Right. So that kicks off your day. And then typically you're back to back in meetings. You're having uh, meetings with Secretary Mattis himself to talk either about specific events or with other senior leaders in the Pentagon. You might jump in the motorcade, head across the Potomac River. And now you're sitting down with the Secretary of State on the seventh floor of the Department of State building, right, where his uh, private dining room is. And now you're talking about uh, how you're going to align national security and foreign policy. So, you know, every single day was a brand new adventure. But it was tiring, but it was a very fulfilling job because you knew that you had a an outsized ability to influence America's standing in the world. What? How would you characterize General Mattis in terms of, you know, what is a key takeaway that we can all get from your experience with him and how we can be better leaders and better people? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's actually you know, as we transition to talking about the new book, right, Top Gun's Top 10, that's what I want to do is provide these 10 leadership lessons, one of which I certainly highlighted also in my first book, and that is just, Mattis stood out to me as a, as, a, as a leader who thinks strategically. And by that, I mean, he has a goal in mind that could be two years, three years, five years down the road, but then you work tireless, tirelessly to align the entire organization to that vision. And Mattis was very good at that because he was very clear. He was unequivocal about what he wanted America's military to achieve. And when you think about the ability to align 3 million men and women who are serving either in uniform or civilians in the Department of Defense, that's no small feat. And so I thought that that was always incredibly impressive. It just reinforced for me the requirement to have a vision and then also to be incredibly consistent with your team. You don't have to be a micromanager and tell them how to do their jobs but you do need to be in a position where you can clearly articulate what you want to accomplish and why it's important to get there. And then you turn the men and women working for you loose and let them do their best work. That's interesting, especially with the entrepreneurial journey. A lot of times you start with a vision and then often you get so bogged down in the, the day to day and just playing whack-a-mole that you can even lose sight of vision. Or when you have a product and then you try to pivot, or you're doing a whole bunch of experiments Sometimes you, you question like, what is the vision? Do I need to have a coherent vision or do I need to do a year of experiment, experimentation? Um, and, and then, especially from, from, from personally, like learning how to uh, train and enable the team around us to be able to do something as opposed to doing it myself, because that's not how you grow an organization. All right, so you have a new book coming out and this is your second one. What is the book and tell me what it's about. Yeah, so the uh, title of the book is Top Guns Top 10. I've actually just got, uh, just about a week ago, my very first pre-order copies uh, where I get to see what it looks like and hold it in my hands. But it's Top Guns Top 10, Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. Uh, and what I want to do is follow a mold that I've seen other people successfully use, which is storytelling, right? I mean, no one wants to be necessarily lectured to regarding leadership. So I use 10 of these vignettes, times I was nearly killed in the aircraft, times where I maybe uh, fell way short of the expectations that had been set for me. But more importantly, what did I learn from those experiences and how they can relate to anybody? And, and I wrote it with my 13-year-old son in mind, the fact that I wanted something that would be gripping, that he could pick up and say, wow, that's a good book, Dad, uh, all the way to the junior executives who I farmed it out to, a few of them to say, well, how does this hit you? And, and, and so universally, it's been appreciated. But it's everything from uh, you know, stories and vignettes about my time when I walked in the door as a Top Gun instructor. I was given 
a four hour long lecture that you have to provide entirely from memory, what that process was like. And that forms the story be storyline behind the chapter titled, Never Wait to Make a Difference. The fact that uh, nothing worthwhile in your career is ever easy. You gotta really put a lot of hard work and dedication into it. Uh, and so it might be a lesson like that. It might be like the time I had my right engine in the fighter aircraft explode on me. Uh, the fact that I had to limp this thing back to an emergency airfield to try and not only save my life, save the aircraft. Uh, and so that's the importance of remaining calm under pressure, right? So you're taking these interesting moments in time and then relaying them to a reader in a way that would apply to everybody, not just another fighter pilot. Can you talk about the experience with the right engine exploding? What, first, uh, what ha like how did it happen? And then what was going through your mind and your body to allow you to effectively navigate that difficult situation? Sure. I think that's the, a testament to any organization that does a really nice job in training the men and women who are part of that team, uh, because that's what you're always going to fall back on. When you hit adversity, when you hit a moment of crisis, it's very difficult to make high level decisions in that moment. You typically fall back on what you know, you fall back on your training and your previous experience. Uh, as we say in the military, you know, your brain kind of shrinks down to brainstem power, and that's what you're running off of. And that's what happened with me. I had not been flying the FA-18 Hornet, the fighter jet, for very long. Maybe just a few months by this point, uh, about maybe 60, 70 hours total time in the aircraft. And I'm out doing a dogfight against another instructor. And sure enough, we're in the middle of this dogfight. I've got my throttles pushed all the way forward, the afterburners going. I mean, it's the maximum amount of thrust you can get from a jet. And all of a sudden, it's like you hit uh, turbulence. Uh, the jet shuddered, it shook violently. And I couldn't see it. The instructor who was behind me could, but there was about a 30 foot wall of flame that shoots out of my right engine as the engine's eating itself. And so basically you just fall back on your training, right? So one of the things we teach in naval aviation is three things, aviate, navigate, and communicate in that order, right? So you've got to make sure you're always flying the aircraft and you do the basics of safety, navigate to get safely where you want to be. And then the very last thing you want to do is communicate, right? Don't waste your time on frivolous things when you're trying to save your life. So you follow those steps, you work through your emergency procedures, get the aircraft on, uh, on the airfield safely in a place called uh, Naval Air Station China Lake in California. And what happened, come to find out, I crawled into the right intake of that engine and I used my hands. You can basically move the fan blades in the engine. Sounded like someone had thrown a can of marbles into the engine. Come to find out when the engine was being rebuilt about a week prior, the person doing that maintenance had left a rag inside the engine, they get pulled into the oil sump, caused a catastrophic overpressure and blew oil all the way up the right side of the jet. So not only did the engine get trashed, the titanium pieces and parts on the inside had actually warped and melted. It was that hot inside the engine. And it was only by uh, really good training and relying on those basic principles that I was able to make sure we got the jet safely on ground. In, in, in the military from talking with guys who are transitioning you know, like you're, uh, in Elite Meet and others who I've been exposed in the past four years, the interesting thing has been they do the same thing in different in situations like time and time and time and time again, like your startup sequence for the engine. And you're just so good at that or whatever the procedures are. Like my dad was a pilot for, you know, through the, through the A330. A I was a pilot flying something much slower, a Cessna 152. But we have the procedures in relatively isolated situations. And, but it made me think about like in business, we don't, it doesn't feel like we have these type of training exercises or relatively well-defined tasks where we can have that level of training and rigor in our training. But maybe I'm just, I mean, yeah, doing a financial model, but like, okay, cool. Like <laughs> that's not really that interesting when you're talking about like, let's talk about something bigger. Like how can we apply the training and your reaction speed and what you experienced to things in the business world as a leader. Yeah, and, and that's what I've found since my own transition in the fall of 2018. You know, one of the things I do besides writing books, I've got my own consulting company, and I found that a lot of companies bring me in either to speak to them, provide training, or be a part of their team as we work through st strategic planning, because that's another element that a lot of companies don't necessarily focus on. I mean, it's very easy to get into the day-to-day -day nature of your job, you're basically, as we would say in the military, you're responding to contact. So the phone rings, you got to answer it and, and act on it. But email comes in, you respond to it. And like we started off at the beginning of this conversation, it can be very easy when that happens to lose sight of your strategic goals, 
you'll lose sight of where you really wanted to go at the beginning of your day in the first place. Uh, you're letting yourself get pushed around throughout your day. So that's one of the things that I've, I've found to be very fruitful is when you, and it's very rewarding as well. When you walk in, you work with an executive team, you work with a CEO, or you work with uh, the members of their leadership team to basically sketch out what the strategy should look like. And then you start putting those left and right guardrails in place, things that will enable you to spin off some of the non-critical uh, everyday tasks that you yourself don't have to be caught up in. You can put those off in a very intelligent fashion. So it frees you up as a, as a key decision maker in your organization to focus on what's really important, right? So if you think about a military unit or, or, a, or a high level company, I mean, there are only certain things that a CEO can do that nobody else in the company can or should do. So why would you want your CEO doing the task of a vice president or someone much lower in the organization? You wanna elevate those individuals so that they're constantly focused on the things that only they can do. Uh, and, and that also helps the organization because usually you find that that now sets clear guidance that everybody can act upon. Can you talk about sometimes in your life, either you know, inside or outside of the military, when you just really might have had a big failure and kind of how oh, you sure. rebounded from that and yeah. kind of what you, how you grew? Sure, well, I think the most recent incident of this, uh, to speak very openly, was, was my transition from the military. It was not planned, it was not the way I had wanted my career to wind up. I mean, basically I was on what they call the path in the military. I'd had successful command of a fighter squadron in the toughest place you can have it in the Navy, and this is overseas in Japan. So we were part of, part of what's called the four deployed Naval Forces. I wound up being the number one ranked commanding officer out of all the others that were there. So that gives you kind of basically the paperwork you need to succeed. And it wasn't until I, I showed up at Mattis's office that I essentially got tasked with a follow-on assignment that I'd already advised the Navy would be unpalatable to my family. It, it had been a rough ride, if you will. My wife and I had been married for 17 years. We had moved 11 times in 17 years. I had three young kids. And you're starting to see where your kids were being affected by the frequent moving. We, just like the move from Japan to, uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, we were there three months and then we're moving to DC, right? So your kids just start getting established in school. Now they're getting uprooted and they're moving again. And that was starting to take a toll, especially in my oldest. You could see him withdrawing inside of himself uh, and emotionally was having a hard time with it. And dad, of course, is in this high powered job, always gone. So it's difficult for me to give him the, the support that he needed. So when we got tapped for a pathway that would have ultimately led to commanding a nuclear powered aircraft carrier, absolutely honored by it, wanted to take it, but uh, based on the conversations, the tough conversations with my wife, uh, needed to pass to focus on the family. So that's kind of what led up to this moment in time that was very difficult for me and that I, I navigated the political waters poorly um, in the Pentagon. So there's this military ethos that if you don't stay on the path, if you don't do the toughest job each and every time, then you're no longer worth the investment, you're no longer worth your senior leader's time. And I found it to be a little bit true. It's unfortunate, but it can be true and that I signaled my intent to not take that path because I wanted to continue to make an impact in national security. Uh, I retired from the U.S. Navy with the full intent of continuing on with the federal government in an appointed position and uh, kind of had my legs whacked out from underneath me. And that put me in a position I'd never experienced before, uh, not only failing to get the next job that I had, I had planned to have, but also, you know, you're just emotionally, it's kind of draining because you poured in all this intent and all this hard work and dedication to make others successful, kind of betting that they would have your back when you needed it. It's very easy in that moment in time. You could, you almost can feel yourself getting pulled towards a route that would make you bitter, make you uh, kind of withdraw inside of yourself because, frankly, it hurts. It's painful. It's, it's not the road you expected to go down. And then you realize pretty quickly that's a self-defeating path. Uh, you can't control the outcome in life, but you can control your output. And so that's where you just basically strap in a little bit tighter into the jet. You continue to work hard. You continue to rely on the friends and family around you who've always supported you and you've supported them. Uh, they're your wingmen, right? They've got your back. They'll help you out. And so by taking that path where you just say, look, that was yesterday. Let's make today even better than yesterday was. And you do that day after day. And suddenly you find that because of that resiliency, you just keep on fighting and, and that will open doorways for you. So the, the <clears throat> what's the uh, transition out been like? And, you know, it's interesting because I, I find not just in my own life, but in talking with other veterans who are transitioning, it almost has this feeling of not knowing even where to start. And it's almost the 10, 20 years of training and experience on all the mental models, for example, it's almost like there's just 
sometimes have this feeling of like just forgetting everything, like all those frameworks to making decisions and thinking through it and going into a completely different context. Right. I was wondering kind of how, how you have, uh, how you have dealt with that and, and worked through it. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd say, if you are in the, in the military and you're considering a transition, don't do it like I did. Right. Which was uh, relatively a spur of the moment uh, decision. It was a limited moment in time. I did not give myself a lot of time to prepare for that transition, both to draw down my military career, but then to also seek guidance from people who were already established in the commercial sector, people who had made the, success, the transition successfully. And I owed that to myself. I owed that to my family. And instead, I kind of rushed headlong into the new thing. So that's the number one thing I would say that just like in any career field, what makes, you, what makes you successful is your own hard work. It's your dedication. It's the fact that you relentlessly pursue excellence. But it's also the fact that you typically have mentors and friends who are willing to guide you and shape you and give you those helpful hints along the way. You've got to seek those people out. If you're looking at a major significant change in your career um, months in advance, preferably a year in advance, you want to be having those types of conversations to chart your next path so that you've got all the groundwork laid for success before you actually make that transition. On a kind of a completely different subject, when you, when you look at the next 10 to 20 years for America, what do you think our position in the world is currently and should be given this, not our current context, with the pandemic and economic crisis, but you know, how do we navigate the next 10 years and take it into context, the past 10 was us being at war, or I mean, past 20. What should our position in the world be in the next 10 to 20 years that are you know, being consistent with what our values are? Sure, yeah, I mean, you raise a great question. I know a lot of people have have asked that very same question, especially in light of the pending 2020 election. What should, what does the future hold for America and what should, what should our role be in the world? One thing that I thought was really fascinating was that when Secretary Mattis would brief President Trump, one of the things he would tell him is that, look, we're not running a charity, for example. Uh, America is a world leader. We lead the world in, in democracy. We've been the de facto leader for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, NATO for decades. Uh, we've led across almost all the continents around the world and, and other nations seek us out because we typically stand for lofty principles that others are drawn to. They wanna follow, they wanna be a part of that type of coalition. But it's not a charity, That's, that is a competitive strength for the United States of America that few other nations enjoy. So one of, the, one of the elements we have to be very cautious about moving forward is we don't wanna cede that ground. We've seen in recent years where uh, we have more openly attacked our allies and partners. Some of it may be considered good because you're asking them to contribute their fair share, if it's monetarily or, or with military. But on the other hand, if you do so in a very openly divisive way, you'll, you'll drive your allies and partners away from you. And, and I know for a fact, having talked to representatives from Israel and the Middle East, uh, other nations in Europe, that they see America as less of a stable partner. And now they're looking at nations like China or nations like Russia or a nation like Iran in the Middle East as a more stable and unifying, you know, force that they can kind of latch onto. So I think that's something that America has to be very cautious about. Our national security, our role as a global leader has been a de facto strength for decades. It's made the dollar the reserve currency of the world. It's meant that we've been able to assure economic security around the world. And it also means that we don't have to defend on our own one yard line by having people want to harm us or attack us on US soil. A lot of that happens in the periphery. And that's what you can gain by having strong alliances of partners. So I think that's something that uh, as we move forward into the next decade, we want to make sure that we don't cast these longstanding relationships aside, that we find ways to strengthen them and work together. How would you characterize Trump's kind of like strategic approach towards allies? Like, is there a strategy towards here's how we should, here's our administration's strategy on how we should work with allies, our messaging, like how, how would you characterize it? Yeah, I'd say the number one, there's, there's, you always have to separate out policy versus procedure. Because right now in America, there's a fairly vigorous debate, uh, largely split along partisan lines about what should America's role as an interventionist country be around the world? You know, should we be heavily involved in the Middle East or in Asia with Afghanistan, for example? I mean, is it worth 
the blood, the sweat, the treasure that we're expending uh, to fight these conflicts or to combat terrorism around the globe. I think that's a very healthy policy debate to have. I think the element that's less debatable and I'm more concerned about is the lack of a strategic approach by the Trump administration. The, and I cover this in the first book, the fact that uh, when the president of the United States makes a policy decision by tweet without any alignment happening behind the scenes with his cabinet secretaries, he catches everyone off guard and they now have to play catch up. Uh, that's, a, that's a strategic disadvantage. Why would you put your, not only your team, but yourself in a situation where the administration looks ill-prepared or not uh, in a position to, to have the best success, right? So these are easy things that could be corrected so I'm a little surprised that they haven't been to this point. What are you most hopeful about? And maybe we can kind of end on this. You know, what are you most hopeful about, you know, in the next decade of how America will be positioned in the world or should be? Well, look, I mean, uh, one thing that I certainly had picked up early in my life and was reinforced by my time serving alongside Secretary Mattis is that having a deep knowledge of history is, is incredibly important, right? So if you think about the upheaval of the 1970s, well, it led to a relatively, you know, a, a period of rapid economic growth, a period of national unity in the 1980s and into the 1990s, right? So you always have these cycles. And I think we're certainly seeing that we're going through one right now, everything from social unrest, uh, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, there's a lot of just elements that are causing some internal division, but uh, as they say, you know, we're going to find our way through this. And so I have uh, significant hope and I feel secure in the knowledge that America has proven repeatedly that we can pull together. Uh, we can get past our internal divisions. We can, we can reunite in a common goal and, and succeed. And I think one of the things that's real exciting about that path forward that is independent of any social issue is just the rapid advances in technology that we've been making as a country and as a nation. I've been heavily involved with artificial intelligence. I used to work at MIT's artificial intelligence laboratory when I was in grad school, right? So to watch, you know, two decades of investment in this technology start to pay dividends, and now you're watching the government, corporations, and others. I mean, there's just so much room for an explosion in innovation, an explosion in uh, being able to propel America forward as a, a continued leader around the globe, I think that that's something that uh, we can't lose sight of. A lot of other nations have significant advantages in various areas, but America has typically proven to be a leader in one of the most important areas, and that's innovation. If you had one quote they live your life by or has helped guide you throughout your life and career, is yeah. there one that sticks out? Yeah, it's actually one that I learned from my father as a really young kid. I'll never forget, uh, he told me all the time, that when you think about your life, uh, the thing you should focus on the most is your time, because time is the one resource you can never get more of. And once you've spent your time, you'll never get it back. So frankly, it just turns into how are you spending your time? What kind of impact are you leaving behind? Are you investing in others? Are you doing something every day to improve yourself? Are you spending your time in a meaningful fashion? And I think that's something that I know has driven me throughout my career, it drives my personal life as well, is just to be very thoughtful and deliberate with how I spend my time. Well, I hope this has been a good use of your time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Jordan. <laughs> it's been great to catch up with you, guy. <laughs>